This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. So we are not okay. We are not doing uh, well and we're not serving our women well. We have a hormonal highway in our bodies. 30% of a modern person's calories come after 8 p.m. You shouldn't be asking your body to do metabolism in the middle of the night. We want women to lead. We want women to be innovative. We want women to take charge. We want women to be at the levels of decision-making in this world, in every field. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Season 2 Expert Series, where you'll meet 24 of the world's leaders in health, discussing their passions and what it takes to make a shift. We tend to be our, our harshest critics. We are more than the muscle and bones in our body. Whoa, that's so opposite of what I was taught growing up. I would like to call to arms for women to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. If you know someone's knowledge, I'm Maslin, you can author actually and host of the exercise shift. better. You can fast better. In the better. expert series, we share the insight stories and expertise better. of each of our amazing experts. We're talking doctors, authors, naturopaths, researchers, and thought leaders. You may have heard them on season two of The Shift, where we took snippets of these interviews to put them together in the series for you. If you haven't listened to season two yet, I'd highly recommend checking out episode one, which will give you an overview of what constitutes women's hormonal health and a sneak peek into the series. We'll provide a link in the show notes. Dr. Amy Shah is a double board certified medical doctor and wellness expert specialising in allergy and immunology, hormones and gut health. She's been named in the Phoenix Magazine top doc list six years in a row now and featured on national TV and magazines such as Elle, People, Shape and Allure. She released her first book called I'm So Effing Tired, and it quickly became a bestseller. Her second book, I'm So Effing Hungry, is due to be released soon. Dr. Shah is a wealth of information when it comes to integrative wellness and helping women to thrive. You'll love this conversation, and if you're a busy woman, this is a must listen. Let's get stuck right in. Dr. Amy Shah, thank you so much for joining me on The Shift. So before we get started, I would love if you could just tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do, and I guess the story of what led you to be working in the field that you are today. First of all, thank you so much for having me and including me in this amazing series and uh, especially around women's health. I came into this because of my own uh, journey, my own own personal journey from a dark place where I could not figure out what was wrong with me. And I had to really lean on my scientific knowledge, my nutrition knowledge, um, and my medical knowledge to put it all together. And I realized, wow, there are so many women like me, women and men, but really a lot of women, especially that I saw suffering in a similar way. And so I knew that there was things that I could share that through my lens, that could be helpful for them. And that's basically how my journey started is just writing and being creative and trying to help people. And through that, I found a lot of personal satisfaction. And I found that there were people who didn't know this information. And basically over the last you know six or seven years, I really culminated a wellness practice that engulfs kind of my views on how to be happy and healthy and have good gut health and hormone health, immune health, et cetera. And so my book, uh, it's called I'm So Effing Tired, is a collection of these ideas that seem to have worked over the years. So when did you decide that you wanted to study medicine? You know, I fell into medicine because I loved nutrition. So what happened is I remember being with one of my really good friends and he suggested to me that I apply to the Cornell School of Nutrition in New York uh, because he had known my lifelong interest and passion for nutrition and health. 
And he said, you know, knowing what you love, that's such a great program and it's not too far. And I lived in the state of New York and there was a special program for talented students in the state of New York that if you apply to certain specialties, you could get a discounted rate. And, you know, in the U.S., education, college, especially at these private schools are extremely expensive. And me being a daughter of an immigrant, I really didn't feel comfortable putting my parents through a private school education. And so this to me was the perfect opportunity. So when I started, I applied and it was extremely competitive and I was so shocked that I got in. And when I was doing my nutrition work in college, I realized, wow, I want to go deeper into nutrition and how it can help health. And when I looked at the options, there was no real option to go deeper in the way that I wanted. And so I thought, okay, the next step, the logical next step for me to see how food can help the body was medical school. And my biggest fear was, would I be able to, one, hack it in medical school because I wasn't the traditional pre-med applicant? And second, I thought, wow, what a great way to blend nutrition knowledge and knowledge of the body. And so I went for it. And lo and behold, uh, I ended up in medical school and I thought, great, this is what I always wanted. Uh, When I graduated medical school in the U.S., you have to go through multiple years of training called residency. And so I chose a residency in internal medicine, which is general medical uh, doctor, like an adult medical doctor. And when I did my three years, I was um, able to go to Harvard hospitals for that part of my training. And I, you know, really felt like, okay, well, I really want to concentrate more on the nutrition aspect, but there is no specialty training in nutrition. So I chose immunology, which is the study of, you know, immune cells. And at that time we were just finding out how the immune cells really helped with food and with gut health. And basically I stumbled upon immunology Um, I ended up doing a lot of work on hormones, immunology, and gut health, and ended up becoming a doctor with a double board certification. However, in the way that medicine is set up today, there's very little nutrition. There's very little room for nutrition. And I landed in an amazing practice with awesome partners, but they wanted me to practice my traditional medicine. You know, they were sending me patients to work in the traditional way, um, in the traditional model. And so because of all of that, it's basically a long story short, I got into my own situation of burnout and fatigue and as a doctor and as a nutritionist and thinking that I was going to help other people solve their problems, I ended up in the dark place myself. And this is often the case, isn't it? You know, that <laughs> just because we have the knowledge, just because, you know, we know the stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that that applies in real life, right? Because there's so many variables that can push us down these pathways. What did you do once you had made that realization that you were in burnout? Well, I did what most people do. I ignored it. I said, okay, I'm, you know, really, this is beyond being tired. I'm having GI symptoms. I'm having anxiety. My mood is changing. I almost felt like I was out of my body. Like I was just going through the motions of the day, but I wasn't really there at all. I was always thinking about the next thing or the, how to be a better mom, how to be a better doctor. And so I did what most people do. I, I just went on with my life. And it wasn't until I was forced to stop and reconsider my life that I actually made changes. So basically what happened is I had a huge life-threatening car accident because of my split mind, my out-of-body kind of subconscious life. So most of us, when we're driving and we are in our subconscious mind, the car drives itself basically because we're in our heads, we're somewhere thinking about the next thing or stressed about the next thing. That's exactly what happened at the time of my car accident. I was rushing out of work because I couldn't tell my partners that I had to leave early to pick up my children. I just felt like, oh, well, I wouldn't be a good doctor if I told them the truth, you know? And even though like in retrospect, I'm like, they would have understood, you know, if I had been able to share with them my struggle. And I jumped in the car and I was so nervous that the attendant where I was watching my children would be so angry and judge me in front of all the other parents because I was 
going to be late. And I was in my head thinking about all the other things that I had to take care of. I was tired. I was cranky. I was hungry. All of the things combined. And while I was driving there, I had this a huge life-threatening car accident and I couldn't go to work for the next one week and I couldn't take care of my children for the next, you know, week or two. And I felt like that was my calling to, you know, basically the universe was telling me it's time to make a big change. And I took that as an opportunity to do so. So you've lived this. So the question that I've asked a few of my experts actually is why do you think that sometimes it takes these massive events for us to make a shift? Because we're busy. We live in our to-do list. If you told me that I had to pause today to kind of take a big look at my life, I, I'd laugh and I'd say, you know, no, I'm too busy for that today. You know, I don't have room in my schedule. And we often, especially as women, we are people pleasers and we have so many people to please. And sometimes what we do is we end up disappointing ourselves and we're really not working on ourselves. I honestly thought that reflection, self-reflection was something that people do when they have lots of free time. And that burnout was something that people do when they're very motivated and want to win. And I realized it's the opposite. Without self-reflection and really editing your life, you will never win. And actually, it's not something that's luxurious. It's something that's absolutely necessary. So I think it, we have to change kind of the mindset. How do you see the state of women's health right now? The state of women's health right now, especially after the pandemic, it's in a terrible state. We are more stressed, about 19% more stressed than our male counterparts. We complain of fatigue and depression and anxiety at higher rates. Uh, A lot of people during the pandemic especially felt a heightened sense of anxiety and depression and stress. So we are not okay. (laughs) We are not doing uh, well and we're not serving our women well because we're not giving them tools. And we are actually putting more on their plate um, than they already had. So we're compounding the problem. A report in the World Economic Forum that we have been set back about 36 years um, from this one year. Oh, wow. That is really interesting. Yeah, women's equality has been set back uh, definitely from this pandemic, especially. So tell me, if women are more tired, more anxious, more stressed, what is the net effect of that for them in their lives, in their health? Well, you know, One of the things we're always wanting as women, we want women to lead. We want women to be innovative. We want women to take charge. We want women to be at the levels of decision-making in this world, in every field. And if we ourselves cannot get past burnout, fatigue, stress, anxiety, then we cannot do those things. It is not physically possible to be the leader that you want to be in a state of burnout, depression, fatigue, stress, or you know, severe stress or anxiety, I think what we need to teach ourselves as women is that you have permission to take time for your mental and physical health. We want you to lead, but lead in a way that is authentic, that is healthy, that is sustainable, and that is more powerful than leading in in the state of burnout. How do you think we've gotten to this point? Well, I think that we've been given two jobs, three jobs, four jobs, because before in ancient societies, or, you know, if you even look at a hundred years ago, there may have been a list of uh, responsibilities that a woman might've had, but it was very clearly demarcated. There was roles that the women uh, took care of, and there's roles that men took care of, traditional roles. And then as women started to get more into the workplace, they started to take on more responsibilities at work. However, they still kept their responsibilities outside of work. And what we realize now when we look at the recent studies is that women are doing more and more and more. And it's no wonder that they feel this way. So I'll give you an example of myself. I'm a physician. I'm a mother. I have written a recent book. And so I've been on book tour, like virtual book tour actually this year. So that's been better. And I am a clinician. Like I go to work to see patients. I just like rushed back from that before starting to start our conversation today. And so 
this is what I mean. Like I am still doing, I'm still going to spend time with my children. I still have to worry about, you know, food, lunches, activities. I have to plan my patient's plans. I have to work on my book launch strategy. I have to do podcasts and interviews. So it's not surprising to me that women are in a state that needs to be fixed. And so what I invite women to do is what I had to tell myself when I was in that place is that I never want to get into the place where I feel broken and that I am more than one day away from recovery. So what I did is I built in things to my daily life to ensure that I would never need a emergency vacation or I wouldn't have be forced into a situation where where I felt outside of my own body. Like I said, uh, it's, it's a terrible place to be. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about women's hormones. Tell me, what are you seeing in your practice with this side of things? What I see is women often think that they have an isolated hormone problem. It's my thyroid doc, or it's my adrenal, I have adrenal fatigue, or it's my estrogen, whatever it may be. But what I realized through my own journey and what I teach is that we have a hormonal highway in our bodies with interconnected roads and then exits like off ramps. It starts in your brain with a master hormonal switch called the GnRH, so gonadotropin releasing hormone. That is a pulsatile hormone that starts the entire cascade. And when that GnRH gets feedback that there's a traffic slowdown or that there's an accident or that there is another problem, it will adjust its pulsatile nature. It will go faster, slower, stop. And so often you will see people with multiple hormonal issues. And that's because it's not just one hormone that goes awry. It's this highway full of traffic or there's a big accident. So if there's a big accident, say near your thyroid, you're going to feel it all over your body because there's going to be a slowdown everywhere. And so the way I think about hormones is that it's interconnected series of places around our body that communicate with each other and communicate back with the brain. So fixing the entire system, unclogging that traffic jam is the best thing you could do for your hormones. Gut health is central to everything, so it may be good to get some additional support. Many of my listeners have opted to do my eight-week Heal Your Gut program. In this eight-week course, I'll take you through the strategies that I use with my patients in clinic every day to heal the gut and give you the lifelong tools you need to support your gut health. To join us, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Programs and Courses. Tell me more about the mind-body connection. Our mind and our body are so interconnected that we're finding more and more ways. So at first we thought there's these indirect connections between our gut and our brain. Now we're finding that, no, there's actually direct connections. There's the vagus nerve, a very important nerve that goes straight from your brain. And it has many, many branches that go into our gut where it gets feedback from our GI tract and then goes back up to the brain. Now we know that there's at least four more pathways that the brain communicates with the gut and the gut communicates with the brain. And the gut is kind of the center of the hormonal and immune system. So we're getting constant communication there. And what we realize now is that not only does the food we eat send signals to our brain through these four or five different pathways we found but that your thoughts can send signals to your body. And so I give the example again of the pandemic. We barely did anything all year and we didn't move a lot. However, we were more stressed and burnout than ever. And so it's not about just having more stuff to do because we didn't have more stuff to do, yet our stress levels and our exposure to negative emotions really did a number on our health. So I think that understanding that and then allowing yourself time every day, every week, every month to strengthen uh, your mind-body connection to learn how to connect your mind to the body. 
I had thought that mind-body connection was this vague term that didn't really mean anything in real life. Like, you know, who has time to meditate for 60 minutes? I thought like, who has time to really do all this like mind-body stuff? But what I realized is that it's not optional and you can do it in any way that you would like in very short form and you can get there. So it's really interesting, that concept of like, I don't have time to do all these things to look (laughs) after myself, but this is the really core problem, (laughs) isn't it? You know, that it's making that time and really understanding it. And I guess for a lot of women, it's like, we want to do it all. And what we don't want to hear is just slow down, you know, just take some time. How do we have it all, you know, how do we have the career and the family and juggle it all, but still maintain our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health? Our modern society has taken out all of these opportunities to improve our mindset, our gut health. We have to be different. We can't do the status quo. So give an example. It's like in my culture where my parents came from, India, there were things built into the ancient cultures that did this. So, so for example, mind-body connection. So connecting your body to your mind can really be done by a series of activities like chanting, like humming, like singing, like praying. These are activating the vagus nerve, the connection between the brain and the body. And it puts you into a more relaxed state. And so I realized, oh, like even the word OM has a humming sound at the end. These humming sounds are very calming to the nervous system and can put you in a better state of mind-body connection. Traditionally, you usually ate a little bit after you woke up. You didn't roll out of bed and eat a bagel and juice. You would actually get up, do some things, uh, maybe gather some food. Maybe you'd get together with your family and then you would eat. And then you would stop eating shortly after sundown. And that, to me biologically, when I looked at it, wow, it made such a huge difference. Biologically, your body is programmed to stop its metabolic capabilities or at least turn them down after a certain hour. You know, just like you wouldn't wake up in the middle of the night to do a difficult math problem, you shouldn't be asking your body to do metabolism in the middle of the night, you know, these late hours are really, really stressful on the body. And just like, you know, if I asked you to do a math problem in the middle of the night, you would get it wrong. It would require more effort. And in the morning you would be exhausted. That's how our metabolism feels when we eat late at night and, you know, don't let it get some rest. So I thought that a lot of these things were programmed into our culture And most cultures around the world have this kind of programming into it. However, we've slowly taken all of that programming out. And so you have to reprogram that back in. So you have to be that weirdo that goes and gets daylight, natural light in the middle of the day or in the morning and then again in the evening. And you will be that weirdo that might not eat that late dinner with the entire group because you've eaten an early dinner and you want to not stress your body with late food or drink. And you might be, you know, strange for giving yourself some time during the day, very quick, you know, one to three minute bouts of activities that improve your mind-body connection. I want to dig more into this stuff, but first I just want to explore this concept of cultural acceptance, I guess, and also outcasting when we're trying to make a change, you know, we're doing something different to our friends and our family. How do people deal with this? Somebody equated it to crabs in a bucket. So if you put crabs in a bucket, there will be some crabs that try to climb out of the bucket, but the rest of the crabs will pull that crab back. And they say that, you know, that's similar to some of the negative feedback or the resistance that you will get when you start to change your life in a healthful way, that sometimes it's hard for some of the people around you. And To me, that really was very visible to me. There were people in my life who supported my growth and wanted to support my growth. And there were people in my life that didn't like it. They either didn't like that I was doing something new and different because it was threatening them in some way, or maybe it was, you know, they felt like 
why not them, you know, whatever it may be, but you can quickly see, and this goes in relationships too, right? They say that the best partner for you is one that supports you, but also lets you grow. Like they are there for you, but they also let you grow on your own. So you're still with them, but you're also growing. And then there's other partners that people find as as they start to grow, that other person wants to pull them back. Let's talk about your book because that's going to get into some more of the nitty gritty of this stuff around fasting and biorhythms and that kind of thing. I love the title. I'm so <laughs> effing tired because I'm sure we've all thought or said that at some yeah. point. Tell me about the book. So the book was really a culmination of all of my ideas and thoughts and put it into a nicely laid out fashion. When I started to share my work and my experience, everyone wanted to know the details. They wanted to know, but how do I do this? And how do I, you know, what, how do I set up my diet so that I'm getting healthful foods if I'm only eating in limited hours? And how do I deal with uh, what foods I should be eating? You're telling me, oh, uh, improve your gut health, but what exact foods should I be eating? And then there were people saying, I don't understand this concept that you're saying that you know, the mind is connected to the body and how it's connected. And so basically I thought, okay, let me just lay it out for everyone. And so the first half of the book is basically talking about why we're so tired, what hormones are, what gut health is, what immune health is, how they're all connected. And then the second part of the book is a done for you plan. So it's basically like, okay, let's put some of these strategies into action for you and take these things and start to do some of these things. So, you know, that means you can follow the two week plan and do some of the strategies that I suggest for you. And then I just ask people, I said, after two weeks, make it your own. There's no blueprint that needs to be exact. You really can make it your own. So that's what the book is all about. And I feel like, you know, now that I've had the opportunity, it's been about a few weeks since it's come out. There's so many more things I want to be telling people and um, adding. And some of these conversations that we just had today are like extensions of that conversation. Like, how did we get here? And why is it that we stay here? And and how come when we want to change, um, some people don't like that? Let's talk about fasting and really rhythms and and how we can sort of harness this. And particularly with women, I know that a lot of the fasting is done on men and there's a little bit of controversy about well, what works well for women compared to men. Tell me what you've learned in your research and in your practice. This conversation around women and fasting is a really interesting one. And what men often don't understand is that women, we really are rhythmic creatures. Like we have this very strong 28 day infradian rhythm that rules so much of our energy, appetite, mood, sleep, all of that. And we have a strong circadian rhythm as well. So there's a circadian rhythm, there's an infradian rhythm, and there's a third rhythm called the ultradian rhythm, which is like your breath and your heartbeat. Um, So these are all rhythms that we have to live with. And so uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is how to do things like intermittent fast and diet and exercise uh, with the knowledge of the infradian rhythm. This is so fascinating to me that the women's hormonal cycle is still something that's like a taboo subject. You know, you wouldn't mention it at work. You wouldn't say like, oh, I don't want to take that project this week because, you know, I'm just about to get my period in a couple of days. It might be hard for me to work on it. It's just not, it's still a taboo subject. People still hide it from their family and friends. And what I want to empower women with is that if you know some of this knowledge, you can actually exercise better. You can fast better. You can sleep better. You can do everything better. Some of the the fasting information that I give to women is around, you know, syncing with your monthly cycle. And then the other information that I give to women is that you may need to adjust it because we are wired hormonally differently than men. And we are more sensitive to stressors than men are. So that GnRH pulse that I was telling you that starts the entire hormonal cascade, if that GnRH pulse 
senses a lot of stress in our body, whether it's physical stress from excessive exercise or excessive fasting or mental stress from emotional or uh, you know external events, it will stop that GnRH pulse. And then you won't get a period, you won't ovulate that month, and you will get maybe some upheaval to your hormonal system. And, you know, women athletes know this very well. They will say, you know, they, they need to cut down on their training or adjust their training because they missed their period that month. And so the same thing with intermittent fasting, I've, I'm teaching women that it's similar to exercise. You a little is good, a, a, a more with recovery is even better, but you don't want to go to the point where your body is literally shutting down. Fasting's like in at the moment. It's the buzz thing, right? And yeah. a lot of people are like, well, it must be good, right, for everyone. Tell yeah. me when it becomes excessive or maybe unhealthy for women in particular. So I have women check in with a few things. So there's no blood test that can tell you if your fasting is too excessive unless you're completely broken. But really the signs that you should be looking for is how's your energy? How's your sleep? How's your hunger? How's your cravings? And how's your mood? So if you check in with those things, you will know whether you're doing the right length of fasting. So women always tell me, what is the right length of fasting? And I say, well, it depends. It's like saying, what's the right length of running for you? I don't, you know, it depends. Like if you're just a couch potato, then walking is uh, better. And uh, maybe running uh, down the street is a good option for you. So same thing with intermittent fasting. Like it depends where, uh, how much you should be doing. For a lot of us, most of us, that are the quote unquote couch potato version of fasters, we should be doing about 12 hours and start with 12 hours alone, meaning like an 8 p.m. start and then you sleep and in the morning at 8 a.m. you break your fast. Super easy, super simple. It's like the first step to a beautiful journey, but you have to master that before you go to step two. Now, what about fasting and stuff around the menstrual cycle? What are some of the key things that you think are really important to consider? Yeah, one key thing, if you got nothing else from this time with us, the last week before your period, if you are someone in childbearing age, is usually terrible for a lot of us. There's cramps, there's cravings, there's mood swings, there's bloating, you know, that whole thing that we called premenstrual syndrome, that is called the late luteal phase. It's the part of our cycle right before we're about to get our period. And during that late luteal phase, you are very stress sensitive and you're not as resilient to stressful activities. So this is not, you don't want to start an exercise regimen or a fasting regimen during your late luteal phase. You want to wait till at least the first two or three days, day two or three of your period, once you get your energy levels back to start that. So one tip I would say is that during that last week, that late luteal phase, increase the self-care, meaning sunlight, sleep, massage, you know, meditation, and decrease the stressful activities, you know, things that can be helpful, but also stressful. So that's your stressful workout. That's your extended fasting. That's your diet. That's your um, stressful uh, project at work. This is not the best time to layer everything on. And then when you get your period and you start, like I said, when you start to get your energy levels back day two, day three, that's the time to really what we say, train like an athlete, eat like an athlete, you know, experiment with fasting, try to try that new project that's quite difficult and stressful. Like these, your body is much more resilient to stress at that time uh, in the first two weeks of your cycle, which is the follicular phase. Have you listened to season one of The Shift? If you're enjoying this conversation, you'll love season one, where we deep dive into the field of gut health with 24 of the world leaders in this area. Once you're done, head back to your podcast app and find episode one. It's a great place to start. So Amy, you were saying that there's only six studies on intermittent fasting and women. What is the research showing for women in this area? 
there's good research showing that it's beneficial. There's a uh, study, a breast cancer recurrence study that was so fascinating. So a doctor named Ruth Patterson did a study on breast cancer survivors. And um, she had them, uh, because she had seen the early data on cancer and cancer recurrence and the benefits of intermittent fasting for cancer patients. So she said, you know, what is the minimum time I can tell them to fast? So she gave them approximately 13 hours. Um, some of them did a little more than 13 hours, but she she basically did a very easy intervention. She said, you know, these women are breast cancer survivors. I don't want to give them really fa- uh, a difficult fasting regimen. She had them in two groups. One was the fasting group, one was the regular group. And she saw that over the length of the study, the fasting group had a 34% decrease in recurrence of breast cancer. That's crazy. If there was a medication that could do that, it would be a blockbuster um, medication. I mean, there's nothing in, in the cancer world that decreases recurrence like that. So we are talking about very, very, very promising strategies here. Um, and this was a very modest fast. So that's why in my practice, I don't push for a long fast. Like it's great if you master the short fasting and you want to try a very prolonged fast of three day fast, say, but it's like akin to running a marathon. Not everybody wants to do it, needs to do it, or benefits from it. Like you can do an extended fast, but that's not necessarily the end goal for everyone. With intermittent fasting, do you think the benefit is giving the gut and the digestive system a rest, reduce calories, which just sort of happens naturally when we're eating, have a shorter eating window. What do you think the nitty gritty of the benefit comes from? 30% of a modern person's calories come after 8 p.m. Isn't that crazy? So like just stopping food at a certain hour is so beneficial, right? For even just the excess of eating because we're not making any good decisions post 8 p.m. when we're going for the food. The second benefit is the circadian rhythm. So every one of us has an internal clock and our internal clock is in every one of our cells and our cells have a program in them where in the daytime they do metabolic functions and in the nighttime they kind of shut off the metabolic function and they're doing more repair and renewal. You can't flip that no matter what. Uh, So When you are trying to eat late at night, you're basically telling that cell that instead of doing its repair and renewal processes, you need it to go back to doing metabolism processes, whereas that was turned down super low. So eating with circadian rhythms on top of intermittent fasting, I think are two like really powerful mechanisms. And then there's this third mechanism that's really gotten a lot of press recently. New England Journal of Medicine published a paper on intermittent fasting and how there's this metabolic switch that happens when you intermittent fast. So what that means is we preferentially use glucose for fuel. And we will use glucose while we're eating and also while we're fasting because we have glucose left in our bloodstream. And then once the glucose is uh, used up in the bloodstream, we actually have stored glucose in our liver and it's uh, in the form of glycogen. So once you use up the glycogen in your liver, then your body has to make a switch. And this metabolic switch happens and then you start using fatty acids for fuel. And then when you start eating again after your fast is over, you go back into sugar glucose as your preferential food. Now, this switch back and forth from using glucose as fuel to using fatty acids for fuel and then back again to using glucose, that seems to be the magic behind intermittent fasting. That act starts a pathway that turns on all these anti-aging pathways that turns on all these like downstream benefits, like increasing BDNF, which is brain derived neurotropic factor that seems to improve, you know, markers that are well beyond what you would expect with just calorie restriction. And so again, I equate it to exercise because we're so familiar with exercise science that it's been easy to think about it this, this way. So when you exercise your muscle, You are growing that muscle and stressing that muscle, 
But there's all these other benefits that happen from exercise. There's these brain benefits, these brain chemicals, these, these downstream changes in our genetics. And that's exactly like fasting. So there is so much more than, you know, what it seems like on the surface. Is there anything else that you would want to mention around fasting for women if someone's thinking about getting into it? Is there any other advice that you think is really important? I think women, just like anything, take it slow. We give ourselves too much pressure to do it all, but do it all quickly, perform perfectly. And with fasting, I have been doing it for years and I still find that I need to adjust for my cycle. I need to adjust for a very stressful period in my life. I need to adjust for, you know, all kinds of reasons. And I can't always go as long as I want. So just be kind to yourself and listen really closely to what your body is telling you. So this program is called The Shift. And what I wanted to ask you was, what has been the biggest shift that you've had in your life? And what did you learn as a result of it? The biggest shift I've had in my life is that I allow myself to take care of my body and my mind. I believe that that you have to make that shift. You cannot think of it as a luxury or that it's self selfish time. That's what culture is telling us, or that's what our upbringing is telling us. What we really need to realize is that we are allowed to take care of our minds and our bodies. So that's been the big shift. One last question. If you could give just one piece of advice to someone that wanted to make a shift in their health or their life, what would it be? Allow yourself time and energy and grace. Just like I did for my life, like I had to incorporate these things into my life on a daily basis. And I had to allow myself to pause and examine my life from afar. So I think that if someone really wants to make a shift, just pause and examine from afar and see what's really going on. And sometimes just that little pause is enough to make it clear what the next steps should be. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for joining me on The Shift. Oh my goodness, there was so much amazing information in this episode. Let's review some of the key points and what action you can take as a result of them. I like the analogy of seeing your hormonal system like a highway with interconnected roads. If there's a traffic accident or blockage, it impacts things down the line because everything is connected. How can you unclog your highway and road network so the traffic flows freely? There were only six studies on intermittent fasting in women at the time of recording this podcast. While there have been some great benefits shown, we need to be careful of interpreting data done on men on cycling women. Listening to your body here is key. When you fast, your body uses up the available glucose in the body, then the glycogen from the liver, leaving no more carbohydrate-based fuel sources. What has to happen then is your body will turn to fat as a fuel source, then switch back to glucose once you begin eating again. This is why intermittent fasting is beneficial. This metabolic switching is thought to be the reason why there are so many health benefits. Learning is great, but action is better. Here are a few things that you could do as a result of this conversation in order to help you shift your health and your life. To begin the process of intermittent fasting, I'd suggest beginning with a 12-hour window where you don't eat or drink anything with calories. In the fasting window, water and tea without milk is fine. On this note, I see a lot of people who are attempting intermittent fasting yet having a coffee in the morning. If that coffee has any milk, creamer or sugar in it, your body will break the fast and this takes away the benefit of that larger fasting window. If you have to have coffee, it needs to be black. Otherwise, I'd suggest that having breakfast would be a better option for you. Herbal tea is a great alternative here. Think about your stress, cycles, and other things that could change the way your body reacts to intermittent fasting. For myself personally, I'll fast until about 11 a.m. or midday when I'm on a ketogenic diet, something that I do fairly regularly. If I have a big speaking gig on over lunch or anything where I feel like I need to bring my full brain power, I will often reduce my fasting window just to be sure I have the reserves that I need. 
The longer you intermittent fast, the more your body will get used to it. But there's a sweet spot that you need to figure out in order to make this work for you. If you're exhausted and grumpy all the time, perhaps your fasting window is too long. A huge thank you to Dr. Amy Shah for sharing her passion and knowledge with us on The Shift. You can learn more about Dr. Shah at amymdwellness, that's A-M-Y-M-D, wellness.com, or follow her on Instagram at fastingmd. If you like this episode, please let us know by sharing on social media and tagging myself and Dr. Amy Shah, Fasting MD, or The Shift Clinic so that we can hear what you have to say. You can also now leave comments on Spotify or reviews on Apple Podcasts. In our next expert series on The Shift, we have Kate Reardon, naturopath, nutritionist, author, fasting expert, and metaphysical healer. This episode has so many great parts, so make sure that you tune in. Coming up on The Shift. We are more than the muscle and bones in our body. The common thing that comes up, and and it's so true in the story of my life, is this feeling that we're not good enough. So the mother is the protector. She's the one that holds all of life. The crone is the woman that doesn't need to apologize anymore. Sometimes I think the best thing we can do to heal ourselves is just get out of the goddamn way. This series is a production of The Shift Clinic. Hosted by Catherine Maslin. Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequality. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how we will get it done. The Global Goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. The Global Goals are a framework that collectively help us support the health of our people and the planet. At SHIFT, we are ambassadors for the Global Goals. This project supports Global Goal number six. Clean water and sanitation. Every time you listen to an episode of The SHIFT, we provide a day's access to clean water for a human in need in Malawi, Africa. Water Water is the the foundation foundation to health, and and we we believe every human should have access to clean, healthy water. So please share this podcast wide and and keep keep tuning in in so we can impact those who need it the most.